Hello and welcome to the Blueprint of the Universe channel where we are continuing on our sacred history and we're currently looking at the establishment of Alexandria and the New Egypt in the place where the line of knowledge first was created and we looked, um, we've seen about the, the life and death of Alexander and obviously the involvement of Ptolemy and the creation of the Edfu Temple as well as the Library of Alexander. But we're just going to look in more detail at the transition of these events because it becomes quite complex. But at this time there are three parts of understanding that we need to look at. Um, and part of this is obviously the decline of Greece itself because once Alexander um, declines or dies a succession becomes in great difficulty because his um, other brother Philip III is quite young at this time and doesn't actually take power well um, and his, his kingdom is divided up into all of his generals uh, at the time and the problem with this is that each one has their own agenda eventually and what they think is best for Greece um, and there's quite a good documentary about this in the series um, I think it's a, um, a general's um, vid set of videos on YouTube and they go through all the, the battles particularly and the politics between the different individuals at this time so it's definitely worth checking that out I actually watched that after I wrote this book and found it even more informative I may even put one of the links in the description below as it's quite interesting um but yeah basically it breaks down and um, this massive kingdom unfortunately uh, starts to dissolve because the rulership becomes in question for the entirety of the um empire so it, it, it subdivides itself and unfortunately uh, it starts to break down because all the um power and the infrastructures were moved to Alexandria so the rest of Greece the Greece mainland actually starts to dissolve away in terms of being part of the new civilization um, because it's ruled by different people there's different politics the struggles continue but Alexander Alexandria and the kingdom of Egypt now being the new Greece um, actually starts to thrive on its own despite its turmoils of the surrounding areas but what this allows uh, other civilizations to do is Rome begins to expand um, and we will look at that separately which is why we covered Rome in part in between this series. So the first thing we're going to do is look at the line of Alexander and his succession in more detail for this. So we look first at this main line of succession which would be King Philip III which was Alexander's brother, younger brother. Now the problem is he was assassinated, he died uh, quite quickly, probably uh, to do with political unrest and the other rulers of the world wanting to take their piece of the pie as it were. So succession quickly passed to Philip IV who was very very young at the time. Now he also died. Um, now what happened was that Ptolemy was given, he was a general rather than a king, he wasn't given kingship, but he was being one of the highest generals of Alexander's army, it's likely that he did have blood relations to um, Philip II because uh, Philip II's predecessors were also named Ptolemy, so it stands to reason that there was a blood link there, so he had bloodline of knowledge, however it wasn't the main pure bloodline, so he was a general but not a king so a succession didn't pass to him directly. Now the problem was, uh, or the good thing was, that Ptolemy had the loyalty of Alexander's army because he was the last surviving head general at the time. So he had the loyalty of the army so he, he could secure Alexandria quite well because um, he had control of the army, they would trusted him um, and he also owned or control of the mainland that would be the new capital so he had a very strong position but Ptolemy knew that he needed to secure his rule and that power alone could not hold it over time and he also knew the importance of the bloodline so he marries a Greek princess called Bernice I now Bernice was said to previously have been married to a man called Philip we don't say which one but we do know that that man died so he was e she was either already married to Philip IV um, or Philip 
um, the third, it's likely that it, it's a difficult one because Philip the fourth was quite young, but it would match the time frame. But it's more than likely she was married to Philip the um, third. But they had a son, Bernice and Philip, whichever Philip it was, had a son, and he was called Ap- Apma the second in two nine two and to two four nine BC. Um, he married. Magus of Cyrene in 317, who was a member of, uh, like a ruler of Libya or from Libya. Um, they had a child called Bernice II, which was obviously um, a princess. Now, Ptolemy and Bernice had a child called Ptolemy II, who took power. They had a son called Ptolemy III in 246 to 221 um, BC. Now, Ptolemy III married Bernice II, therefore cementing the bloodline, because whoever Philip was, he was one of the royal families. We don't know, say, if it was fourth or third. But their descendant, Bernice II, married to Ptolemy III, who was the, the great uh, the grandson of Ptolemy and Bernice cemented the bloodline to make Ptolemy the fourth, who was the ultimate um, rule of a bloodline of the king line from Alexander, without question, because it was two bloodlines linked together, one of them more direct to the main family line, and the other one slightly outside. And Ptolemy the fourth ruled in two two one to two o three B.C., cementing that legacy in place there. Interestingly enough, then. But Ptolemy um, the fourth was the one who actually finished, as far as we know, um, the final parts of the Edfu Temple, showing the link and lineage between Ptolemy the first, Orpheus, and um, the rest of the kingdoms. It's, it was like this final statement. Now, interestingly enough, um, obviously their son Ptolemy the fourth was the one to commission the Rosetta Stone, but also solidified the context of translating things like the Kabbalah into Greek, as we mentioned in our last video, which shows the importance of the passing of knowledge. What is important though, what's quite interesting, is that Ptolemy IV and his wife, because the family starts to intermarry quite a lot with cousins and sisters and things like that, and that's because they know, it's one of those jokes about Cleopatra and the inbreeding of kings, but remember this was done in Egypt prior, but it's actually an important factor when we look at events later on in history as well, but this is a tradition of the line, um, it's just made more documented now, but in ancient Egypt it was exactly the same. It was the same practice of inter- intermarrying to keep the bloodlines pure, to keep the, the special gene that allows higher functioning um, people to, to continue, which uh, it might seem a little bit far-fetched, but that's what we've studied all the way through time, the use of the king-making ritual, the higher use of trans state uh, practices um, within certain sacred spaces like the Edfu Temple and, and um, the Lighthouse Pyramids, the um, uh, Tower of Babel and, and uh, uh, Temple of Solomon, for example. All of these were built to facilitate this practice, and uh, this practice was based on the strong genetics of the bloodline that was passed on from top. It is a sacred symbolic concept, and this uh, was only kept alive by marrying people relatively close to the family. But because of the diminished bloodlines, they, they resorted to quite close marrying. Um, and we'll see that quite a lot in, in the context as we move on with, with the Cleopatras, for example, and the other Ptolemies. And, but what is more interesting here is that Ptolemy IV and his wife at the time were represented as Egyptians, not Greeks. They were, because they were in Egypt, they've reclaimed their homeland, they're trying to be the Egyptians, but their predecessors were originally. They want to be the Egyptians, they want to be Toph's descendants, because that's who they are. That is, they're not just doing it as a show and tell that we are now Egyptians, because they are Greeks, they admit to being Greeks, but they display themselves as Egyptians, and they take on the Egyptian cultures, the philosophies. So my thing is that, that yes, they're translating stuff into Greek, but they're also trying to relearn and re-establish um, the old hi- hieroglyphs. Um, and the the Egyptian language because it's the old shamanic ways, it's close to the origins. And so we see on the side of temples that the king and queen are represented as a new version of Osiris and Isis. 
And this is extremely important because it's the reuse of hash, it's the retelling of the story, it's the rebuilding of the king-making ritual and making it public for everybody to see, to say, we are the new Osiris and Isis. And you replay the same stories in the court, you re-establish the 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 court of the king but it's been developed because now we have the library we have all this knowledge from the greeks and aristotle and plato and, and pythagoras we have the new building techniques from um, jerusalem babylonia we have the new armies the new military and we have the new trading strength it, it's like a developed revitalized improved version of egypt but they are they know they're reclaiming their homeland that's the most important thing we need to establish they are reclaiming what where they came from their roots their origins and so when we look at figures at this time they are in greek where they are wearing the pharaoh's headdresses the crowns of the old and upper kingdom the the poses they're written hieroglyphs are written around them but we as popular people maybe haven't if you think about children at school they don't know the difference between the new greek the new Egyptians and the old Egyptians because they look the same but we have to remember they aren't they're Greeks and um, but they come from Egypt in the very 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 distant past and that's why they're trying to reclaim these things it's, it's so important we remember these things because it, it's almost lost now so imagine in 10 20 30 years 100 years people aren't going to know any difference unless we continue to make these connections these establishments um, and point out commonsensical aspects of history. Um, so let's just look at the rest of the Ptolemies and how that plays out in the future. So moving on from Ptolemy V, um, Ptolemy V had two sons, Ptolemy VI in 181 BC, who married his own sister, as we mentioned previously, of the intermarrying Cleopatra II. Remember the name Cleopatra was also the name of one of Philip II's daughters. So we see the connection there. So they're using the same names. If they wanted to completely remove their Egyptian um, Greek heritage, they would not be using Philip's uh, daughter's names. They are uh, tipping the, the hat and nodding to the, where their uh, names came from, which is very important. Uh, they had two sons, Ptolemy VII in 170 BC. Unfortunately, both two kings passed, and the rulership went to the second son of Ptolemy V, who was called Ptolemy VIII, who married Cleopatra II after his brother died. They then had four children, Cleopatra IV, who married her brother Ptolemy um, the Tenth, uh, sorry, Ptolemy the Ninth in 116 BC, and they had a child called Ptolemy the Twelfth. Neos or Neos Dionysus. Cleopatra seen the first married her brother Ptolemy the Tenth, also known as Alexander the First of Egypt, because it's Alexander, but now they're just ruling Egypt and they're just acknowledging that fact that they're no longer ruling the entirety of Greece, which they're not, to be fair. They had a son called Ptolemy the Eleventh, um, or also known as Alexander II in 80 BC. At some point, Cleopatra seen also had a child with Ptolemy IX, named Bernice III, again use of the same name prior in 81 BC. The use of a changing name of Alexander and the king indicates that he was considered the rightful name and the family to rule um, as the other generals in the areas that took on parts of Alexander's kingdom did not have children named Alexander. And therefore, in the eyes of the populace, obviously didn't have that um, connection there. So they were just establishing that they had the true and ultimate bloodline, which was their fault because they killed uh, Philip III. So they're not going to have a bloodline, are they, if they kill the person that had the rightful blood rule there. They're kind of taking themselves away and we don't care about that because they didn't know the sacred knowledge. We didn't know about the importance of bloodline. Only the closest to a family knew, which was Ptolemy at the time. Um, so yeah, so um, the father Ptolemy X, the uh, they had a daughter called Cleopatra V in 58 BC. Cleopatra then had five children, Cleopatra VI, Bernice IV, Ptolemy XIII, Cleopatra VII, and Ptolemy XIV. It would be Cleopatra VII of those that continued the line, as we will see later uh, on in history. Um, this was the beginnings... Um, 
and the basic outline of the rulership and the bloodline being expanded of the legacy of Alexander the Great. Now the thing is we can see that there's multiple children here, the reason being that they understand that intermittent marrying is probably bad, but they have to do it to keep the bloodline alive. But if you have six, seven, eight children, one you're securing the succession if anything happened to them, but you're also creating a diverse bloodline a little bit later on, so in two generations or so it's removed enough that you can intermarry a little bit more freely without the issues of brother and sister but unfortunately that doesn't happen because at the time there's lots of deaths um, but we have to remember the same thing happened with Abraham um, and um, uh, all the sons of the below uh, it also happened previously with people like Noah for example that was written about where you know they had to have multiple sons of a high number in order to create multiple family bloodlines in order to then marry later on down the lines so it's forward thinking effectively but at this time the options were slim and they had to stay within Egypt within their own bloodline um, but yeah, so that's that's where we get to. So there's quite a lot of information there that we need to unpack, and there's quite a lot of symbolic actions of, of the name, which again we need to address because it does come up later on, and we're coming up to the quite conflictual part of the um, time of Christ, for example, the, the the conflict between Rome, Egypt, and everything else, and it becomes a very sticky situation with all the misinformation we've had, um, and it's it's all about the timeline. So we're coming up to that period of zero BC AD where a lot of things happen, and we need to establish facts and baselines before that so that we can start to unravel the mysteries and the mess that is that period. And so this is one of those key moments in establishing bloodlines and the royal family and where the line of knowledge comes from because it's both tied to them as people uh, because the prophet line priest line always follow them around um, as are linked and related usually but also because um, it's the bloodline that's where the king making ritual gets passed on to now we see interestingly enough the name Ptolemy and Cleopatra is also used continuously with different abbreviations 7th, 4th, 5th and so on Cleopatra seen um, Ptolemy the Great and also Alexander the names Ptolemy and Cleopatra become the new titles of Osiris and Seth, Romulus and Remus, that kind of thing. It's their version of Osiris and, uh, oh, sorry, Horus. Osiris and um, Isis, who are the king and queen, and then Alexander is kind of like the prince who becomes Ptolemy. And the name um, is used as a title, so it's like every king is Ptolemy or Alexander. Every king is even though they might have a different name when you're a prince, for example, uh, because we know even in modern day that the king, once the prince becomes a king, is allowed to change his name, and he generally doesn't. Same with the pope, they can change their name, and the name change they pick is a title, um, or it should be a title, and that's it was the same in Egypt and the dynasties, they will pick a name that is synonymous with the family and the rulership of the lands that represent the upper kingdom it's more of a, a symbol than a name usually it means something like the uniter of the upper and lower kingdoms but ultimately they also use the name Seth and Isis and Cyrus within the rituals they're using within the court of the king which we looked at in the previous videos um, to remember if you just join us now it can be quite complex but we remember we started from the beginning of history and we've seen the development of all these practices being passed on so you have to understand now that if you're just joining here really you need to then go back and look at the original source of this line being passed on so you can see the symbology the similarity the passing of the torches the use of the same practices with different names because if you don't you're kind of missing the point of what this series is all about and so i invite you to go back and, and read that and listen to it because it really does set the scene for now every every step in history every new civilization is a footstep above the one prior and without the one below it it could never exist on a higher level um, and we're passing that knowledge on and on and on using the same things because it's based as an attempt to keep using these rituals to keep using the court of the king to keep trying to build the city of the sun to keep the bloodline going to keep the knowledge line going to keep the line of knowledge developing and that's what it's all about and that's what new civilization was built for 
not the other way around. It was built for the line to protect the line, to develop the line, to keep the line going. It wasn't a other way around. It wasn't it, the line wasn't created after the civilization. It was already there and it moved to it. Um, but equally, like I say, there are other parts to this, political parts within which we don't discuss because we're just looking at the main players, but there is a lot of other pol political factors and the other individuals that took parts of the empire all warring with one another. And they all play parts because they are at war with Ptolemy and the Egyptians and it, it does influence them, but it's not something we go through in the channel. But I do invite you to watch that link in the description about the generals video because that series within their series is very in-depth and although it just works on battles and politics it gives you a good idea of the complexity of the situation at the time but that's it for now thank you very much take care and goodbye hello and welcome to the blueprint of the universe channel where we are continuing on our sacred history and we're currently looking at the establishment of alexandria and the new egypt in the place where the line of knowledge first was created and we looked um we've seen about the, the life and death of alexander and obviously the involvement of ptolemy and the creation of the edfu temple as well as the library of alexander but we're just going to look in more detail at the transition of these events because it becomes quite complex but at this time there are three parts of understanding that we need to look at um and part of this is obviously the decline of Greece itself because once Alexander um, declines or dies a succession becomes in great difficulty because his um, other brother Philip III is quite young at this time and doesn't actually take power well um, and his, his kingdom is divided up into all of his generals uh, at the time and the problem with this is that each one has their own agenda eventually and what they think is best for Greece um, and there's quite a good documentary about this in the series um, I think it's a, um, a generals um, vid set of videos on YouTube and they go through all the, the battles particularly and the politics between the different individuals at this time so it's definitely worth checking that out i actually watched that after i wrote this book and found it even more informative i may even put one of the links in the description below as it's quite interesting um but yeah basically it breaks down and um, this massive kingdom unfortunately uh, starts to dissolve because the rulership becomes in question for the entirety of the um empire so it, it, it subdivides itself and unfortunately uh, it starts to break down because all the um, power and the infrastructure has been moved to Alexandria so the rest of Greece the Greece mainland actually starts to dissolve away in terms of being part of the new civilization um, because it's ruled by different people there's different politics the struggles continue but Alexander Alexandria and the kingdom of Egypt now being the new Greece um, actually starts to thrive on its own despite its turmoils of the surrounding areas but what this allows uh, other civilizations to do is Rome begins to expand um, and we will look at that separately which is why we covered Rome